Board of Education. Today is October 22nd, 2013. And with that, um, before I turn over to public audience for anyone wishing to address the audience, I'm going to uh, leeway time to Superintendent Curtis, who would like to make a few comments. Thank you, Lydia. Um, prior to getting started with the board meeting this evening, I just wanted to take a moment and uh, discuss uh, the unfortunate manner in which uh, Simsbury High School Spirit Week unfolded uh, last week at Simsbury High School. And I recognize that many members of the senior class have received uh, quite a bit of attention for an incident that took place on Friday. I'm going to ask Neil to comment uh, on that shortly. But I do just want to step back and acknowledge the fact that leading up to the incident on Friday, uh, there was quite a bit of um, interaction and kind of a mentality that was um, starting to arise between classes of one class uh, pitted against another class that really started to air out quite a bit over social media um, and the word of that was leaking into the school even with some you know some rumors of poor behavior that would have taken place had we held uh, the pep rally so uh, I'm pleased that we made the decision to close the pep rally uh, and just want to state that after many conversations with administration uh, we recognize the fact that our intentions to try to co you know collaborate and create that collective spirit uh, through our spirit week activities the way we had things structured didn't work and um, I know that in Neil's uh, communication to the, the students that Friday Neil's communication out to parents we talked about the fact that we need to take away from this and all reflect uh, on what we want the Simsbury culture and climate at the high school to be. And I think from a takeaway standpoint and a next step standpoint, that's where uh, I look forward to working with the kids at Simsbury, working with the administration to reframing uh, what that looks like from a, uh, from a joint aspect. So I'm going to turn things over to Neil. I, I, I will say that uh, anybody that's involved at this point um, does not feel good about what happened and I mean that goes from you know my seat as superintendent I know the high school administration had an opportunity to talk to, to Jacob and other students as well and Neil has made an effort and will continue to do so uh, to reach out to student groups and get their perspective there are multiple perspectives on how this w w was handled there's mm -hmm. the student perspective and there's the uh, kind of the administrative and staff lens that Neil will talk about a little bit but I think you know most important is to recognize we have great kids uh, we have wonderfully supportive families and we have uh, a staff that's dedicated to, to moving forward from this and really creating a very positive atmosphere as we move forward throughout the year. And I think early signs of that were positive. We had a great football game, enormous turnout, um, and a successful dance. So that was immediately on the heels of what was an unfortunate incident. But I'm going to uh, ask Neil, uh, who met with his faculty today, to go through some of the specifics because we haven't had to had a chance to do that to the board and, and to communicate to you on that. And I know we'll, anybody in public audience that wants to add comment after that will be able okay. to do that as well. Thank Very you, good. Lily. Okay. So I'm going to share some comments that I made with my okay. faculty um, today and, and try to be uh, brief about it. But, you know, obviously it got some attention. Um, and I think as as uh, Superintendent Curtis uh, implied, it's it's become a kind of unfortunate and embarrassing event. It's unfortunate in that what it started as was a uh, attempt at the senior class's unity and solidarity, and it kind of turned wrong. Um, and I can explain uh, some of the uh, reasons around that. It, I think it was also unfortunate in that a lot of what went wrong about it was unplanned. So uh, that. Uh, therefore made it more difficult to kind of get uh, some uh, control over and uh, I think it's really become embarrassing not only for uh, the fact that you you know you can't control the media once a story's out there the the media will take it where it, it wants to go but it's become embarrassing for the members of the class who feel that the community has is looking poorly upon them for um, and that uh, they they kind of want to rectify that um, and that's I think an important part of this so we are we've spent some time thinking about it we're trying to have an appropriate response we know that uh, the response kind of has to be balanced between kind of what unfolded and and uh, what we need to to yeah as I said in my communication to parents it needs to be a teachable moment that you know the the um, so at the same time that there are consequences for it, I always refer to um, discipline as a, in a school matter. Uh, it, some of you have probably heard this from me before. Discipline comes from the same root word as disciple, and it's about teaching. Um, and that's how we're trying to use this moment um, as, as a teaching moment. So 
just a moment on the facts of the case, because I think they have been misrepresented a little bit in the media. Um, so the, the piece of it that was planned is that um, clearly the uh, the senior class planned to gather during sixth period, which is our lunch wave period, um, and that was uh, promoted and kind of orchestrated through Facebook. Um, through the first lunch, uh, we did have music playing. It was kind of high energy. That's pretty typical of the Friday of Spirit Week, that we would allow that to kind of go on. And during the first lunch, it looked like any other Spirit Week that we were going to have. At the end of the first lunch wave, when a group of students would typically be done with lunch and then go to class before the next group comes in, that group of seniors did not leave. So now you have one group of seniors there, clearly had been orchestrated ahead of time, here comes the next group, and now you have a few hundred kids in um, the cafeteria, and it's not the normal flow anymore. So uh, the music was playing, one of our assistant principals uh, asked for it to be turned down for a moment, um, made the announcement, look, it, I know it's Spirit Week, but if you need to go back to class now, now's the time. And we uh, received uh, an unexpected reaction that we had students chanting that they were not going to leave the cafeteria. So a very unusual reaction, one we are not used to getting. Um, so my administrative team kind of uh, huddled and said, what do you, how do you want to handle this? Um, and um, certainly saw the music and that as part of it, asked for the music to be shut off, um, got some temporary cooperation with that, it would go back on, and then finally said to the student who had the portable stereo system, um, you, need to, you need to shut it down or we're gonna take it away. At that point, the student got up to leave and literally go put it back in his car. Um, having been there, I could tell you uh, it was not his plan to have the senior class follow him out. And so at this point, as he leaves the cafeteria, here comes an entire group of people following him. So um, the what you end up with is some unintentional leaders of something completely unplanned, and it starts to go through the hallways. And this is the part that certainly was um, covered in the various media outlets. Um, and there is no particular leader of it. Um, the It goes kind of three quarters away around the second floor of the high school, down to the first floor, kind of halfway around, out to the lobby, and then outside. So the whole thing probably is uh, eight to ten minutes in duration before it goes outside, but it involved uh, at the start probably 250 to 300 members of the class, and by the end of it probably 100 to 125 members of the class. Um, the uh, nature of it, because it had disrupted the hallways, it was loud, um, we, we felt at that point it was unpredictable. Um, I, I, made, I turned to um, my assistant principal at the time and I said, I don't, they're out at the field now, but I don't know where they're going, where they're going next. Um, and I, I was one of the ones who suggested we probably ought to get a few officers here because I don't know where they're headed next. Um, I th and think that was the right call because it really was a pretty unpredictable um, situation. Um, the students stayed out at the field for about five minutes. They chanted, they cheered, they took pictures, they came back inside, some went to class. Some went back to the cafeteria where some further kind of interaction with the junior class happened and it was put kind of a stop was put to the whole thing. So that's that's actually what happened. I would call the duration of it from the start of the second lunch wave till the end of it outside and back in probably 20 minutes of, of um, what happened. So uh, in terms of uh, how I'm trying to frame this for people now, now that we've had a few days to step away from it, is that I really think there's two perspectives on the issue. And I've, um, the, the adult perspective, and um, I think it's a fair one, is that it had been a pretty typical spirit week energy until it, until it took on an element of refusal. I mean, and there was a clear element of refusal from students um, to um, cooperate. Um, failure to respond to adult direction, and it disrupted the classes in the hallway. Um, 
and took on that element of unpredictability. As I've talked to seniors over the last few days, um, the, the, the situa I think they see it very differently. And in addition to wanting to understand their perspective, but trying to get them to understand our perspective on what happened. Um, they, they viewed it as an event that brought their class together. They planned to get together in the cafeteria, have a fun spirit weekday, celebrate. Um, but and while there had been some tension with the juniors, they, there is not a single kid who said to me that gathering had anything to do with what had been going on um, that Mr. Curtis referenced. Um, certainly their view of it is that the walk out of the cafeteria, the walk around the ha hallways was completely Im unplanned and it was without a malicious intent. And um, they are actually themselves now upset that it's kind of been portrayed as this unruly, um, uh, mean-spirited group, because that is not what it was. Um, but it was an unpredictable group, uh, in part because it was leaderless. It really, mm -hmm. there was not anybody at the, at the core of who, who was calling the shots um, to do this thing. So what I've tried to say to my faculty today, both perspectives are valid. That, that the, the student perspective of what was going on is valid, but I think the adult perspective uh, is valid too. And I think we've had some healthy conversations with groups of students. I've met with the student leaders and the captains and some of the students that we've already had in on consequences on this and had great dialogue about your perspective on it and our perspective on it. So as um, we um, have responded, I've been trying to use the old analogy that sometimes we use during um, budget times, that the, the proper tool here is not a hatchet, but a, a scalpel to kind of look at what we're doing here. Um, there are some clear consequences. M many students who chose to be there six period simply cut class, and they are receiving the appropriate Simsbury High Discipline for um, cutting class. A few of the students who did become unintentional leaders of this, recognize that they became unintentional leaders for this and have taken on some, some further um, consequence. For um, the others, they're kind of a, a large group in the, in the middle. They participate at different levels. There are members of the class that come out, kind of follow the crowd for a little while, realize this isn't the best idea, I don't even really know what's going on, and they kind of go back. And there's students who carry it all the way out to the, the full march through the school and out to the field. So um, our, our answer at this point, and I'm gonna be addressing the senior English classes um, on Friday, is um, actually we've, we've looked at the cameras, we can identify a whole bunch of students who were participating, but we can't identify every single one. And so our goal at this point is um, to ask the senior body to, the student body to kind of make a right out of a wrong and we're gonna ask them to self-identify. If you were part of it, we're gonna ask you to come forward, do the right thing, um, and turn it into a group community service effort um, in response to what has happened. So um, that is kind of our goal going forward, um, because as I say, the, the, the process of identifying students on a camera based on what has happened here, I don't think is a productive one. And I think we could turn it into a, a, a much better um, situation. I, mu I must note that there are many, you think the senior class can't be uh, painted with one brush. There, there were many members of the senior class that were in class that were not part of the uh, demonstration, and there were many who kind of peeled off early on um, in the situ in the situation. So. Um, Final follow-up, certainly, as I said, the meeting with the senior class, we actually are doing some things. It, uh, social media in the days leading up to this and then the actual organization in the cafeteria fueled this. And believe it or not, we had actually uh, planned a program. It'll, it's coming on November 19th. We'll say more about it. Um, through Dane Street around social media and the responsibilities of uh, it's it's kind of a spin around college athletics and social media but the person that we've contracted with said certainly the program can expand beyond that to talk about the responsibilities of using social media and certainly something we want to capitalize on 
in terms of Spirit Week, I think uh, we've all learned that it needs a reinvention at Simsbury High School. We have had um, some circumstances building over the years that have turned it into a class versus class mentality. I referred to this in my communication to the parents, um, and I think it just needs to be stripped down and rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And we'll take care of that process through our student council, through our Trojan Wall group, um, and, and kind of get at it again next year and then lastly I think some follow-up with our our junior class who was a part of the the tension that had risen during the week um, because this is not solely about the senior class and we recognize that and certainly want to address those leaders so um, ultimately uh, I was as disappointed as anybody last Friday and I think my communication um, uh, let you know uh, got that out there um, but the fact of the matter is i think that uh, as we step back it's a teachable moment we're going to treat it that way it's teenagers who made a mistake um and we are uh we think handling it in a way that is um appropriate to an event that needed response but that um uh i think got mischaracterized in a media uh, reporting of the story so um, that's where I'll leave it um, but happy to take on any other questions I don't know if that's the format for this thank you Neil. we we felt appropriate too. Neil and I had a chance to meet with uh, Jacob as a student re student representative <coughs> who uh, would like to voice his perspective and Neil and I both talked about multiple perspectives in this and we felt as his role here would be appropriate um, to share some information with you this evening so go ahead Jacob Thank you, Mr. Curtis. I would like to start by thanking this board and the administration of the Simsbury Public Schools for giving students the opportunity to have a voice in matters of education by creating the position of student representative a number of years ago. It is imperative that students have a voice like times in times like these, so I thank all of you collectively provi for providing us with this opportunity. I would like to preface the remarks I'm about to make by first commending the outstanding response from members of the high school community and senior class. It is clear to me that students at Simsbury High School are invested in their future and the future of their school and are prepared and willing to engage in meaningful discussion about our school environment. That said, there is clearly a desire to respond to what happened on Friday. I solicited feedback from my classmates via Facebook. I realize some of these comments may overlap or disagree with information already provided by Superintendent Curtis and Principal Sullivan, but I do feel it is my responsibility as a representative of the student body to express the collective views of my fellow students. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, I will not be able to read all of the comments and insights provided. So I would like to apologize to those students whose comments I have shortened or will be unable to read tonight. But here is a selection that I hope represent the feelings of students across the spectrum at Simsbury High School. It wasn't a flash mob, as detailed in the letter sent home by the administration. There was no food fight, as suggested by the media. An important factor sh that should be brought up is that everyone was under the impression that the administration told them, the students, to go outside. Seniors were mistreated, and if it was that big a deal as the administration made it, people would have been arrested and homecoming would have been canceled. It was blown out of proportion, and it wasn't a small group of seniors. The faculty should have responded instead of waiting for the police to do their jobs for them. It was less than authoritative behavior on the faculty's part, if you ask me. The student carrying the boom box was asked to leave, and he did. The class voluntarily followed. He did not persuade or influence anyone to join him. We were never violent or directing anger towards a certain class or individual. We just had school spirit. We never did this to disrespect our administration or our peers. It was all carried out with good fun. We weren't protesting anything. People only got really angry when they ripped our decorations down. They claimed that they did it because the wall was a fire hazard. It didn't seem to be a high fire hazard the past three years, just like the music was never a problem. They ripped them down because they were, they were pissed. We were going to class. They could have given detentions later to kids who skipped instead of acting on impulse and ripping our stuff down and causing the uproar. I can honestly say this was the most amazing experience of my life so far. There was a moment in the cafeteria when everyone put away their differences and we all became one united body of students. I am honored to be such an amazing part of such an amazing graduating class. Respect gets respect. The sooner our administration learns this, the better. I feel, viol I feel as violated as anyone at how the administration handled this. But without an apology, we look even worse than the news is making us out to be. It doesn't have to be extensive. Just acknowledge the fact that we know what we did cross the line and of course that it could have been handled better by the administration. No one acted like adults. 18-year-olds don't run the world for a reason, and the administrators didn't act like adults either. 
If there's a situation like this next time, they should start just writing down names and handle it later when the situation is under control. A perfect representation of how this was never malicious was the reactions we received from the students, teachers, and staff members. Students, teachers, and police officers alike gave us high fives, laughed, cheered, and filmed us. By only defending ourselves and blaming what the administration did, or didn't do for that matter, we are just making things worse. If none of this happened, the administration wouldn't have had to do anything at all. So in other words, by saying the administration handled it horribly, it's just a statement, it's just saying that we did something that required administrative action. We need some sort of statement that balances our justification with critical comments and an apology. We should be more mature to take some blame. I'm not apologizing for something that was all in good fun and united us as a class, finally, and that did not result in violence or arrests. I am proud to say that we are the class of 2014 and we were able to come together for once in our four years at SHS. I agree that we need to remain unified as a class and not throw anyone under the bus. However, I don't think we can expect the administration to acknowledge their faults unless we are able to be mature enough to apologize. I agree that we should apologize so the senior class doesn't get more taken away. But what bothers me is how we look now to everyone because of what, of what was in the news. We're all applying to college right now, and I know it's not going to affect it a lot, but for one of the top schools in the country to be shown in the news so badly is going to hurt us a little, and it's not fair to us. Students aren't taken seriously ever, and administration never takes faults for its actions. We really do have several good points, including how faculty tore down decorations is basically just as blatant abuse of power, and how the entire situation was only escalated by the administration's attempts to control the crowd, when they simply could have stuck with detentions for people skipping class. That being said, a lot of focus is on 300 becoming one, and are forgetting that the class has 400 students in it. I think it's only fair to those not involved and those who agree it's more mature to also apologize that we at least include an acknowledgement of how we broke the rules as well. Now, my hope through reading these comments was to give the board, administration, media, and our community insight into what the students involved in this event felt. There are truly a wide range of reactions to this. Regardless of what opinions may be on how to react to this, one thing is abundantly clear. The students of Simsbury High School do not, under any circumstances, deserve to be the victims of misreporting on behalf of the media. It is also clear that in the opinion of large parts of the student body, there was inappropriate behavior on part of the administration and faculty. I will seek to work with Superintendent Curtis to serve as a liaison between the administration and student body to make sure this is addressed. And finally, there is clearly a desire from sections of the senior class to apologize for what happened to students not involved, to teachers, to the administration, or to the community as a whole. Over the coming weeks and months, the class and, senior, the class and Simsbury High School as a whole will seek to put this event behind us while also learning from the lessons it can teach us. I would like to commend this board for introducing and maintaining the student representative position and for the opportunity to report on these events tonight. Thank you. Okay, with that being said, thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Um, I'm going to open up to public audience. Anyone wishing to address the board, um, please state your name and address. Can anyone yes, sir. You, you, please state your name and address for the record. Sure, it's uh, Richard Johnston, 78 Laurel Lane. Um, I think I commend you, Mr. Sullivan, for giving a good fairly accurate from what I was told by my son what happened and Jacob that was that was very good but there was one thing and I, I don't know if this has been brought out but I have heard multiple times from my son through multiple people and I understand it's third hand and I'm but there was some inappropriate language used by a particular administrator um, that I think was a real problem um, from my perspective the kids need to be held to a standard and they should get some punishment for what happened because they did disobey whatever rules are in place. Different than when I was in school. Things are crazy and times and the social media stuff doesn't help. But I just think that that needs to be addressed. Whoever was doing it and there are kids, I don't, kids probably don't want to say who it was. I mean, you know, they don't want to come forward. I'm sure they're as I would be, a bit fearful to say something. But I, I've been told that there's multiple kids who have witnessed and heard inappropriate language. And I just think that's an issue that needs to be addressed somewhere by somebody um, within the, and, I, and I'm not putting this on Mr. Sullivan at all. I'm just saying, because it was not him, but I know there was someone else supposedly speaking 
inappropriately to the kids and trying to bring things down, which I don't think it did. I think it probably just made things a little more tense. So I just, that was my only feeling. That was, I was concerned about that. We have to all be adults at the end of the day. And, and that's, that's a big concern. Otherwise, and, and to me, this is a lot of, <clears throat> it's really not as big a deal, I think, as it's been made out to be. So in Mr. Sullivan's statement, he, he made, I mean, I think he kind of agrees with that, that it, it turned out to be a bigger deal than it really, really was. Um, there were kids blowing off a little steam, a little civil disobedience is not necessarily a bad thing, and they learned from it. Administrations learned from it, I hope. Everybody's learned from it, but I just think that that one particular thing kind of eats at me as a an adult, having been a teenager and now an adult and a parent. That that's to me that's unacceptable. So I, I have a I have an issue. With that. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for your comments. Anyone else wishing to please state your name and address? Wendy Richard, Green Berry Court. I just want to echo the same thing as what uh, Mr. Johnson had echoed. Um, my son is not involved uh, in the whole scenario or incident. Uh, but what came out of it was really, I think, incur a lot of wrath and reaction to that was exactly what he just said. And this is what my son read to me, um, or said to me. The administration allegedly swore at students, and I asked him to give an example. Students who may have come up from the classroom, I wouldn't mention names, but he told me who they are, and they are straight A student, very, um, you know, no, they are good students, and they heard actually the administrator say the, the word, and it's not meant to be said here. And also, um, the reason why they went out was they heard Mr. Sullivan say to go outside, and that's what they did. Although I must say that that doesn't warrant um, any exemption from any disciplinary action for the behavior of going outside and chanting and making a rowdy um, scene. And I felt also in um, having to tell you guys that um, whoever that boy is, the boombox, Mr. Sullivan has also confirmed that, so are my boys, that he was basically bringing the boombox, I was told, to the car. He did not anticipate the crowd to be rallying behind him. And for that, he was actually asked to do a Saturday detention. I don't know how many days, but I think the student felt so um, downtrodden. And I hope that the administrator, our administration would come together and rethink about the consequences on this particular boy, or student, um, to avert any further issues, if we can. Thank you for that comment. Anyone else wishing to address the board? Seeing none, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'm sure we'll have further uh, discussion at another point. Thank you. All right, thank you. Moving on to board and administrative communications and Jacob, any further communications from you? Well, I think that it's just important to point out that for all that happened on Friday, that Spirit Week did end pretty positively. I mean, I think the football game was successful. There was nothing thrown as, as far as, you know, nothing like that. So I think that was, and the turnout was great. So I think we can look at the football game and then the dance as two positives to what may have not been such a, a good thing to come before. So I think we ended on a, on a better note, if not a good note. That's glad, good to hear. Susan. Todd. All set. Mike. All set. Chris. Uh, I just want to confirm for members of the curriculum subcommittee that we have a meeting next Tuesday uh, in the morning, and we'll send uh, a confirmation agenda out on that. Thank you. Mike. Uh, just a quick update on the negotiations committee. We are, uh, the process is unfolding the way it should. We are on schedule. We are where we would be in any normal negotiation. Uh, at this stage, uh, we have entered, uh, I guess, negotiation and mediation, and uh, we'll have a uh, comprehensive report for the first meeting in November. Good to hear. I'm all set. Oh. 
Su Susan. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to share with the board that John McDonald, who is our consultant from ERCM that did our security audit early in the spring, is going to be coming out this Thursday to meet with administrators, head custodians, and representatives from both police and fire to do some training regarding our standard response protocol. And those are the uh, four um, protocols that I discussed with the board in the spring regarding a lockdown procedure, lockout procedures, shelter in place, and evacuation if we would um, be faced with situations that would necessitate such actions. So we'll be um, giving the board some highlights, but I wanted to let you know that that work is moving along nicely. Good. And we'll hear the results after, after the meeting. Burke. Nothing right now. Very good. I'm all set. All set. Yes. Okay. And um, I just would like to just share with the board that um, hot off the press um, last week or two weeks ago had uh, submitted our um, application for K Board of Distinction Award. It's a, a level two award, and we have been awarded that award as of today for um, for matching the criteria, the necessary criteria. And uh, so we um, will be receiving that award at our Cape Caps conference in November. So again, thank you for your participation to fellow board members for, uh, for helping with that. All righty, we will now move on to recommended actions on exhibit one, approval of minutes of the October 8th meeting. So move approval. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone abstain? Abstain. Susan abstains. <coughs> Motion passes. We are now on to exhibit two personnel. I have one recommendation for the board's consideration this evening. Mrs. Elizabeth uh, McKay, who's a social studies teacher at Simsbury High School for the past 11 years, um, has requested a point for non-salaried guaranteed leave of absence for the purpose of child rearing. And this is in accordance with our Board of Education policy 4260. And this would be for the period of November 8th of this year through June 30th of next year. It is the recommendation of the superintendent that this leave be granted with the guaranteed full-time position upon her return. So it's the recommendation that the Board of Education grant Mrs. McKay a .4 non-salaried child rearing leave of absence for the period of November 8th of this year through June 30th of next year with a guaranteed full-time position upon her return. So moved. Do I have a motion? Susan, do you have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions. Motion passes. Thank you. We are now on to Exhibit 3, Acceptance of Gift from Terrible School PTO. First of several here tonight is for Terrible School, and Principal Scott Baker, I believe, will be able to fill out uh, a little bit more of the details, but essentially we have a, a, a very generous donation of $8,109 for tech, technology funding and all that. Uh, if you'd like to speak to what that Sure. Um, so the PTO at, at Terrafield School, one, one of our central missions is, is to um, provide the resources um, for our kids to succeed in the 21st century. Um, as most of you are aware as well, you know, Terrafield School is a, is a school where not all of our students come as equipped um, as, as um, you know, surrounding schools. And so access to, te to technology is really important. Um, and so the PTO has um, agreed to purchase a set of 25 Chromebooks um, and a cart. Um, and this is in addition to the technology initiatives that um, you're already supporting. Um, and I, I just came off the heels of a Common Core and Smarter Balanced um, workshop on Friday and looking at all of the technology skills that um, our students are going to have to do. This is going to serve them well in providing. I know that you've had a chance to take a look at these Chromebooks, but. Um, the fact that they can just be instant on, the batteries last all day. Um, it allows the teachers to really use it as a tool, as, as easy as a, like a notebook and a pen and a paper. Um, it can be just take them out and use them rather than wait you know, for a computer to boot up. Um, so um, we already have one cart, it's going really well. I wanted to wait and see how that went before um, the PTO decided to do this, but now I think we're ready to go. So um, I really want to thank my PTO. They, they do a phenomenal job at, at fundraising. And, uh, and helping me fill out our mission at Terrafield School. So, thank you. Good. Very good. Do I hear a motion? So moved. You hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? The motion passes. Thank you to uh, to uh, Terrafield PCO. It's very wonderfully very generous, generous gift. Very generous. We are now on to Exhibit Four: Acceptance of Gift from Element from the Elementary School PTOs. Okay, this is one you haven't seen before, but uh, just wanted to give a little bit of background. Uh, really, what we're asking to uh, accept here is all five of the elementary school PTOs um, give a, a portion of funding for the cultural enrichment committee of the uh, K-6 level, which is another group of dedicated volunteers who've been um, working on this for uh, many years, and they select and schedule um, the uh, cultural uh, groups that come in and, and provide programming within our schools. What changed in the last year or so is that now the way that the, um, the board is now actually holding those PTO funds and then paying them out uh, to, those, to those groups. Uh, and, and so because of that, technically, we are now receiving these donations uh, in excess of the board's policy. So we thought it was a good opportunity to, to both, again, thank, uh, thank the PTOs for all their generous donations and also the work of this group of uh, volunteers. So we would ask you to accept this total donation from our five PTOs of $5,597. I can also just say with that particular um, item that our, the leaders of that particular, the cultural enrichment group met with the elementary principals and the partnership that's working together to make decisions and mm -hmm. schedule and the topics of the presentations has been going quite well. And we met with them last spring in order to um, plan something for this upcoming school year. So it's, it's really quite powerful and we do appreciate the PTO for stepping mm -hmm. forward for this for our elementary schools. What do you have planned? What, what is the I event? need to oh. ask. I don't have all the <laughs> topics oh, in front oh, okay. of me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I can get those for you. We just, we just had it. Like dancer acrobatic um, piece that it was one of the best that we've had so far it was unbelievable but just um, so it's a mix of um, entertainment and culture we'll have, um, right. three times a year and the uh, the quality of presentations they go out and get is really amazing um, what they do. and all the stu all the schools so yeah. all yeah. All they, go, schools they go to all the schools <laughs> Very, very good. And is the culture enrichment the, the committee they select? They work with principals. They work with administration on yeah. the mm -hmm. particular yes, event. Yes, selection. Very good. Thank you. Very generous. Um, do I have a motion? So. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Extensions. Motion passes. Thank you very much for the five PTOs' generous contribution. We are now on to exhibit. Oh no, we've done. Thank you. One more. One more. One more. Okay. One more. So one more. Oh, this, I'm sorry. This last one uh, is an anonymous donation uh, that would be made to Latimer Lane School of five thousand uh, dollars. The planned use would be to um, purchase some more Chromebooks for that school for our students, and also for a mounted um, monitor uh, for the front lobby, as you see in some of our other schools, <coughs> for, for uh, uh, letting folks know what's what's happening. And uh, we would uh, ask that you accept that gift. Very good. Do I hear a motion? Salute. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Again, thank you very much for that very generous gift for Latimer Lane. We are now on to information reports, Exhibit 6, District Strategic Plan. Okay, so. Um, I will kind of kick this off, and Neil, you can actually come up because you're going to present just momentarily. I just have a yes. few minutes here to, uh, uh, to talk a little bit, and I wanted to bring attention in your folders uh, to the public publication of our Simsbury Public Schools uh, annual report. So this signifies uh, an important uh, kind of point or important marker in our continuous improvement process, which I know you're all familiar with, a process uh, in which we establish uh, action plans relative to the Board of Education goals. Um, monitor those plans throughout the year and come back in and vet and report out on our progress relative to the Board of Education goals. So this publication, this format is something we came out with I believe three or four years ago. I think it's a great tool for our district in terms of communication piece and what we value and what's important. Um, historically, 
superintendent had done a bit of a more detailed report on the outcomes for the Board of Education goals. We're going to change the format a little bit this year. Neil has always done a Simsbury High School report where he has reported out on the progress of the goals and then laid out the framework uh, in the focus areas moving forward for the school year. So certainly we have that report tonight, which is great, and we'll cover much of the information in here. Uh, at our next board meeting, uh, Mr. Brian White, the principal of the middle school, will do the same. We're now going to have a middle school report and give Brian an opportunity to talk to the board about his progress towards the board goals and then the meeting after that we will bring um, Scott back with the elementary group uh, and report out on our focus areas uh, and areas of improvement and I think that'll give us uh, a, a different voice at the board table which I think is important and they can talk a little bit more about the building based work but certainly a lot to be proud of as a district uh, Neil will hit on the secondary pieces of that today uh, and a reminder to the board that we're at the end of our cycle with our improvement indicators and our board of education goals and we will be initiating a process this year probably starting in the January time frame uh, to take a look at our board goals uh, take a look at our mission our vision and our core beliefs do some streamlining there and then have a collaborative process between the administration and the board in some workshop formats to establish new improvement indicators and new goals so I'm certainly looking forward to that process it will guide the work uh, for the next five minutes but I know Neil has a pretty detailed report here he's gonna start uh, and share with us and Aaron's got a piece of that because we wanted to talk about another important subject which is the common core and the smarter balanced assessment but how it's integrated into the work at each of our levels so I'm going to turn this over to you thank you <laughs> all right so we're going to kick this off there's actually uh, four parts to our presentation tonight as um, Mr. Curtis just uh, mentioned I'm going to be presenting to you various aspects of the Common Core and SBAC as it pertains to each level as we go through uh, these presentations. Neil, of course, will talk about the indicators of success um, that encapsulate uh, Simsbury High School, uh, his vision and his high school report that you've had the opportunity to, to review at this point. And uh, Mr. Uh, Dane Street will be joining us momentarily. He's, he's, yeah, he's at a field <laughs> hockey game. And at the end of our report, he'll give an update on the athletics and student activities at Simsbury High School. So when we uh, think about the Common Core State Standards, I'm going to remind you um, that they cover two areas, English language arts and mathematics. And when we think about the English language arts, there's key features, four key features around the Common Core Standards. And we actually are using the anchor standards to the Common Core to help guide the work at um, Simsbury High School. It's around reading, the sophistication of reading that takes place. It's about writing, the different types of writing, argumentative, informational, and narrative kinds of writing. Uh, it's about speaking and listening, oral communication. It's about learning how not to just speak publicly, but to collaborate and to um, do research collectively together. And then the language aspect of the Common Core State Standards is obviously around editing, revising, grammar, but it's also the effective use of language and um, use of academic vocabulary in the classroom. So that those are the key features and those are the kinds of topics that students will be um, working on in classrooms um, across uh, literacy in English, science, and social studies, and in the technical areas as well. For mathematics, the key features are around in, in the content area are around focus, coherence, and rigor. It's about going deep into the content, making sure that it's coherent from grade to grade, that students are acquiring the depth of knowledge that they need by the end of eighth grade, that algebraic knowledge, so that when they enter the high school, they have a very solid foundation in which to uh, be successful in the higher level math uh, courses at, at our high school. And it's around rigor, and it's not about doing more, but it's about the depth of understanding, the ability to pl apply concepts, and it's about their ability to be fluent with mathematical topics and concepts um, and application of it. There's another aspect of mathematics, which are the mathematical practices. There's eight of them. And in the middle school presentation, I'll talk more about those. But it's really those habits of mind around mathematics, about, about being persistent, about being able to problem solve, multiple ways in which to problem solve. And those practices are integrated all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. 
So what I'm going to do for you tonight at the high school level is I'm going to give you some um, examples of what students experienced on the CAPT, which was a 10th grade assessment, and what they will potentially um, experience on the Smarter Balanced, which is an 11th grade assessment. So the first one I'm going to show you is the reading across the disciplines. That was the reading test that students took in 10th grade. And this is um, a performance task. And basically what students have is a short story. It either would be a page and a half to two pages long that they would be required to read and then would have to respond to the literature and read for information. And so what you see next are the kinds of questions that students would be faced with when trying to answer about the literature that they just read, multiple choice format that they would have, the types of writing that they would have to do around that literature would be two open-ended kinds of questions where they would have to use evidence from the text to explain their thinking and uh, their, their uh, point to each of these questions. So that was the experience that students experienced with the CAPT um, in 10th grade. This next example is an argumentative performance task that students will see on the Smarter Balanced. We actually have a link on our um, website where you can actually go in and take a practice assessment. And these are examples that I've taken right off of that, some screenshots for that. So again, this is 11th grade. And this is what students will see. This is the electronic format of what they will see. The left half of the, the page actually can be slid over. And what really students will see here is a scroll of four different sources that will come before them and then there are four parts that students will have to um, answer so this particular performance task is around public art and it's around whether the argument is whether they should be government funded or privately funded so when you look at some of the questions that students are asked to do, they have to uh, read the sources, the four sources. They have to pick a couple of sources. They have to look at the claim. They have to be able to support that and then type it into that text box. And they do that. They do that for the first question. They do it for the second question, the third question. And then in the end, they, they constantly have to be taking sources out of those and they can go back and forth. You can see that, that particular half of the screen will slide over and so they can go back and reference those sources but they have to be pulling information from that text. They can't in the sense plagiarize it. They can't just cut and paste or highlight and take that and use that as their claim. They have to use it in their own words. They have to be able to explain how they're supporting, what evidence they're using and how they're supporting it. And that's an example that uh, students will see on the Smarter Balanced Assessment for a performance task. A performance task um, actually entails students um, in a classroom setting for about 30 minutes being able to discuss what's upcoming potentially what the topic is of the performance task and then individually they'll have about an hour and a half in which to answer these questions going back and forth and so these text boxes obviously would expand for students to um, how to long is in. the article the article I can't show it here it's not live right um, but it scrolls down it's hard I actually took I took about eight screenshots okay. so it's about eight screenshots okay. <laughs> but to your point Susan one of the things is skill development not as much for the secondary uh, students but middle and, and elementary of how to manipulate the screen so that you're not assessing kids tech technological ability you're Right. you're assessing their skills and knowledge mm -hmm. so that's something that's one of the things we really wanted to demonstrate is how different it actually looks in terms of the traditional test versus the test that's completely based online right so in the end of this they're making the argument should it be government funded or should it be privately funded and they've used the sources along the way in which to come up with this final argument that they're writing at the end yeah just to, i'm sorry okay. you mentioned sources so they only get to use what's on Correct. this article there's no there's obviously background knowledge that students would have along the way for whatever reason that they've learned through their experience up through but the evidence that they're using can are only on come these from what's sources. on the screen but of course when students write they're using background sure. knowledge as well in which right. to support that right i have a question too i mean you've probably answered this many times before mm -hmm. Who corrected or graded the, the CAPT and who corrects or grades the 
So if you that's analysis. that's great. If you go back and you look at this particular, this was a fill in the this was um, number two pencils, and they had to fill in, and so they went through machine scored. They were sent away, boxed up, taped, right. and sent away to be scored. These were scored by scores, human scores, that would give it uh, um, points. You could get up to three points for each one of these. But not not necessarily the, their own teachers. No, no, no. These no, were this is all done outside. Done outside right. of it. Okay. This is this will be scored. We haven't seen how or why, but these will be scored as, as, through the technology okay. that is provided. So I also want to give you an example of a math. Um, this particular um, is a released item um, that was made available, and this is a capped open-ended, what's considered almost a performance aspect on the capped. And what this is looking at is it's giving um, information to a student, visual information. It's telling them that the population of this particular town has been increasing over time, and the table shows the population increase. And so there are two questions at the end that they have to write and give you the um, format that they write in, but it's typically it's like those boxes that you saw in the last cap. But what students are asking are being asked is by what percent of the population, how has it been increasing? So they have to use some mathematical formulas to try to figure out this percentage increase. They have to show their work, they have to explain their work. And the second question is they're trying to find a pattern as to why this is happening. Um, it's a growth model that they're trying to show here. This is uh, about an Algebra 1 concept, but it also is reviewed again in Algebra 2. So this is the experience that students would have in math on the capped. Now I'm going to move to the smarter balanced assessment and this is again in 11th grade and you'll see that this is um, in, in, it, it's inclusive of algebra, geometry, and of um, algebra 2 concepts. So this is around speeding tickets and these are this particular um, screenshot is the information this is the information that students get for this particular problem so they see how New York speeding fines are assessed so that you see for 1 to 10 miles 11 to 30 or 31 or more and you see a minimum fine and a maximum fine and then for Massachusetts you see from 1 to 10 miles per hour over the speed limit or 11 or more how they're assessed fines so what students are asked to do is that they have to analyze the speeding fine systems for both mathematically analyze for both New York and Massachusetts and then use the data that they gather and their understanding <coughs> to um, define a, a <coughs> fairer system um, for New York State so this screen, this I pulled over, you can see how I pulled that over on this particular screenshot, and then it goes back, you, you, it goes back. So here's the first problem that students are asked to do. They're asked to plot the points, so they use the information off of those two, uh, ch or off the chart, the second chart, the table, for Massachusetts, and so they have to use their math skills in which to plot those points. So they're gonna make a, a plot, a line graph, and not really a line graph, but a plot across that, starting from zero all the way through, for fines for less than 10 miles per hour over the speed limit and then beyond that. So this is part one and there's seven parts to this particular problem. So this second part of it is the student has to create an equation to show that first piece that up to 10 miles over the speed limit. So this is the equation that they have to write for that particular aspect of what they just plotted. This equation on the third one is the second part of those uh, speed limits from over 10 miles per hour or 20 miles per hour. Um, so it's a two-piece um, problem that they're putting together um, for this math problem. Now they're looking at the scatter plot for the New York speeding fines. So they created one for Massachusetts and then they wrote two equations. Now they're looking at a graph already um, given to them. Now what they have to do is draw some line segments in which to demonstrate what it looks like for speeding, speeding tickets under 20 miles per hour and then a second line segment for those 20 miles per hour or over. Um, so you're, you'll see that it would be a sort of a flat line and then one that goes up. So now we're on to the fifth part of this particular um, question. And what students have to do now is create an equation for the graph they just saw for the New York speeding fines for less than 20 f miles per hour over the speed limit. And then the sixth one is create an equation for 
um, over 20 miles per hour over the speed limit. And then finally, they have to write about what they've discovered by using the data from the graphs to then define what would be a fair um, way in which to assess speeding for the state of New York. And they have to agree or disagree with the claim. They have to explain it um, and give rationale for it. And that's the problem that they will experience, a performance task that they will have um, for mathematics. So when we, Aaron, have been talking over the past couple of years about the work that both Brian has led and Neil at the high school about what we're calling our kind of gold standard end of course assessments, we're trying to shape assessments. Multi-step. Multi-step, performance-based that kind of march us towards this end um, in an effort to create more complex tasks in the classroom for Correct. kids. But as you can see, just the complex nature and the multifaceted aspect of this is a big change. Are there less problems on the exams because there are so many, I mean, this is vastly different than the This is the performance ABCD. task, so there's different parts. There's the computer adapted part, which there will be still multiple choice and fill in the blank and those aspects to it, which will be about a two hour, up to a two hour. And remember, it's computer adapted, right. so it depends on how students move through it, but right. they're giving us some time frames to it now, so about two hours. This performance task, it appears that they'll have one of these. So they'll okay. be able to talk about their thinking for 30 minutes in a class setting with teacher direction of some sort. We don't know all the parameters around it yet. Okay. But then all of this this work that needs to be done will be done individually and they'll have up to about an hour and a half in which to do this. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. There's still, it's not completely clear to us, but we're using some of these examples. The other piece with the Smarter Balanced is that there will be about 40,000 items in mm -hmm. the bank in the sense that those are the um, types of, and they'll be classified as um, easy, more difficult, very difficult. So if Sue and I were taking the assessment together, we would never have the same problem in front of us right. when we're doing the computer adaptive portion of it. So the, just to stick on that one point there. When you talk about it being adaptive, mm -hmm. how are we getting a sense if everyone's taking a different test? Well, it's they're all categorized in a, a level of difficulty. So we're still, although we're maybe using different um, problems in the sense of solving them, it's still at the same level of difficulty. So if we pass that level of difficulty, we'll continue on to the next level of difficulty and so on. What we don't know yet, correct me if I'm wrong, is from a kind of aggregate standpoint how this data will be reported out to the district. You know what I mean? Comparable to a cap, which has that. always been percentage of kids meeting a mark. Right. We don't have that level of detail now as to what that will look like. Um, you know, the adaptive test should allow us to individualize instruction more, but we don't know what the public report card, so to speak, will look like yet. We don't know that. What we do know is that it will be nationally normed. It will not be Connecticut normed. Right. So the cut scores will be a national cut score. Right. So we'll be compared nationally for all of the mm -hmm. states that are um, taking the Smarter Balanced Assessment. So as we think about this, um, we will be engaged in the field test this spring. Um, and again, um, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but we're, we're told that it's going to be around the last 12 weeks of school. We'll learn more about so that. our junior class will take this Correct. this spring? Correct. The field in a, in, so in a pilot, in a pilot, pilot sense. Yeah. In the okay. pilot. It's a pilot. We're not going to get data back. Okay. Um, that we don't know what kind of data that we will get back on this. Um, the formal, real assessment will take place in the spring of 2015. 15, right. um, and there also will be some interim kinds of formative assessments that teachers will be able to use, as Matt was just saying, we, we could use them in the fall, we could use them in the winter, that will really help that in-time class adjustment, individualized based assessments, so that we can see how students are doing as they're moving towards those summative evaluations at the end of the year. Just, so. I, I will throw in what we did a pilot of SBAC tests last spring at the high school. All of our 11th graders last year were brought down to the conference room for a week and sat for the test. On the math side of things, it was very interesting that um, while you were allowed paper, just the very notion of doing math on a computer mm -hmm. 
was a Very challenging mm -hmm. thing for students. The writing equations on a right, computer was un un buttons. so right. using all of these buttons that you see here was just a very unnatural act in terms of how you're used to doing math. Mm. Right. And so that I think is something that over time will have to be overcome. Right, because I'm thinking they're all very used to their graphing calculators next to them, and mm -hmm. if they're only right. using the calculator on here, that's Correct. a big difference right, right then, it, right. right there. So, right. and you um, can see how you can pull down the calculator. There's right. buttons to pull down the calculator, so it's all right there for you to be able to use. Right. right. So, my point for um, uh, sharing this with you tonight is to, to begin to give you examples of what students have experienced in the past and what they will continue. Uh, my intent is at the middle school is to give you some sense of what it looks like at the middle level and then finally what it looks like at the elementary level. And I have a district-wide letter going out to our parents tomorrow that outlines some more background information on the Common Core SBAC. It actually has a link, Chris, you had suggested in a prior conversation to one of Aaron's former presentations on the board on SCTV oh, that came out mm -hmm. pretty clear that provides some background and we're considering uh, you know, creating a parent night as, as another way as questions, you know, more questions as they should are coming forward from parents about the Common Core curriculum and the assessments in particular. So I think that we'll be putting together some information sessions, um, allow people access to that and ask questions that they might have. And we're engaging teachers also in the process of uh, them taking the tests themselves and experiencing that. And I worked with the middle school math department last Wednesday on our professional development day. and. They were interested. They um, were, you know, they they thought it was a, a good experience for them to um, take the assessment, and um, we had some some really good conversations. And what we're attempting to do, both at the middle school and the high school, is say what is it that kids need to know and understand at each grade level, so that they will be ready and prepared to move to the next. And as I said at the beginning, to really in math in particular, have that solid algebraic understanding because that is the foundation that students need and if they don't have it their chances of faltering somewhere down the road um, could be quite high and um, so we're spending time looking at our curriculum and using the the standards as the foundation in which to guide our work but certainly using our curriculum in which to continue to build um, experiences for students um, at the middle level and at the high school level so that's the first part, and I'm going to now uh, pass this off to Neil. And some of the um, indicators of success I already shared with you back at the CMT and the CAPT, and he's going to go through those rather quickly, but there's other data points that I think you'll be interested in seeing as well. All right, well, I'm much happier about this portion of the evening because <laughs> it's an opportunity um, to really come and talk each year about the great work um, at Simsbury High School at all levels from um, from my administrative team to the department supervisor group to our teachers to the performance of our students and it's um, always a great <coughs> evening to highlight for you not only the the markers that of course are our report card but um, some of the work as well so we start with the data piece of this as I typically have done with the board uh, I know that Aaron a few weeks ago did a capped and CMT report so we only gave you a couple of slides as a reminder um, our capped performance uh, was uh, equal to where it's been historically. As I've said to this board over time, um, you, you can't get too caught up on up a point here or down a point there. You you look at the steady progress over time. Um, so in this particular year, we were up uh, slightly in math and reading, down slightly <clears throat> in science and writing. Um, but for a last full administration of the, the capped, we were pretty pleased with our results. And we always, like to point to the marker of a percentage of students that passed all four tests and uh, in a minute here you'll see a slide too that 62 percent represents a very high watermark of uh, students passing all four uh, meeting goal on all four tests um, that may be the next slide is it Aaron no, no the, the, one this one is that. the DERG comparison before we get to that mm. what you see of the the boxes representing the height of the boxes representing our performance and the, the 
average of the DERG so that you can see on most of the tests there's a pretty healthy gap uh, of where our performance is, is exceeding that of our comparison schools, um, most notably in reading where we've always um, really had historically high scores. I will point out this year that our reading scores were fifth in the entire state, so even, even topped a number of the DERG A schools on that particular um, test. Um, and our science scores, as uh, we've noted over time, have been um, strong, but not as strong as the other areas. And that is something that we need to look at because this was the last full administration of the CAPT, and the only, uh, the only mm. test that's going to be given this year is the science test. So um, certainly our science uh, department is well aware of that. Um, and I had a meeting today with our science department supervisor around the continued look at, at our practice there. Um, this is the slide I was referencing earlier where you can see uh, uh, all the percentage in our DERG of meeting a goal on all four tests. State average at the bottom is 32%. In the DERG, it's somewhere in the 50s, and uh, Simsbury High uh, up slightly from last year, kind of hitting that 62% mark on all, all, st all students meeting in all four areas. Very, always very proud of that one. Um, so very quick CAPT report tonight because you had it a few weeks ago. But uh, to turn to advanced placement data, um, our course enrollments continue to grow. Uh, I didn't know if that was going to happen because we have had a slight decline in enrollment. We haven't had the big one yet, but we have had a slight decline. So I didn't know whether the numbers would go up, but in fact they did. Um, and the class of 2013 had an all-time high, 68% of graduates leaving high school with an AP course completed. Um, and it will show you in a minute it historically where that compares. Um, the worry always as our participation has increased was that scores would drop. And what I can uh, proudly report to you now is that we have stayed in the range of 80, 81, 82 percent of uh, the tests that are taken. That's the percentage that are passed. And that number is not dropping. It's been very steady for five years now. So 80 percent of the Simsbury High School students who sit for an exam, pass it. That's a comparison to a national number that is 60%. So I want you to understand that, that it's far out, um, outpacing what happens in the nation. So uh, to show it to you visually here, you can see the, uh, the block, again, represents the courses taken. So over time from uh, 734 courses taken all the way up to our new high of 1148 AP courses. Um, the blue line um, indicating the number of exams that are given um, uh, it, over the course of the May test window, two weeks, um, and the, that, that number was um, just below that 1148. And then the yellow showing the number that, that uh, achieved uh, a three or higher. You can note historically that those numbers were very close together when a smaller population of students took the exam. But as I said, if you look at the last five years, the gap has kind of remained about the same. And that's what we're keeping an eye on. Um, our high, our, we had 82% last year, it's 80 this year, which is where it had been kind of the two years before it was 82. So we're, we're really maintaining um, our progress there. There's also a number that the College Board reports called um, the equity and excellence number, and it's a, a key uh, percentage in, a, in high schools uh, when, when this kind of data gets uh, reported. That number refers to the percentage of students in your graduating class who passed at least one exam. And for us, that number was up seven percentage points to 59%. So of your graduates who crossed the stage last June, essentially 60% of them had already passed an AP exam when they were leaving high school, which is incredibly um, impressive. Um, SAT scores, um, always try to present this uh, 
to you of where we stand. Uh, again, the, the state numbers I'm not too worried about. We would expect to outpace where the state numbers are, which is the line in the middle. But what I think this represents graphically, again, is how far we're outperforming the DERG on this. So the light blue being the average score of the other DERG B schools, and the dark blue being where Simsbury's performing. So you can see um, a, a healthy uh, gap in, of 17 points in, in math of uh, what do I 27 points in reading and 22 points in writing of out outpacing where the where the derg is you, we always look at it in a five-year trend, um, and you can see uh, here um, up on one of the tests from last year, but not in a statistically, none of these are statistically significant. Up in the middle one, you can see the reading number uh, has gone up over the last couple of years, um, but the math and writing are down a point or two from um, a year ago. Uh, the the highest one of the highest classes we ever had was that five year out class um, that you, you and you may some board members may remember that one. Those were historically high numbers. Um, and I, I mean, I, I guess it'll look better when that drops off in the next five <laughs> year. Um, but that was a historical high back five years ago. <coughs> Uh, always at this report, let the um, board know about where a lingering issue um, stands. Um, and those of you, uh, I'll, I'll look at uh, Ms. Tadone and Mr. Goman, who were here back in the uh, old days of talking when the community had a lot of conversations around grading patterns and difficulty of getting an A in Simsbury High courses. Um, definitely have had an upward trend. It's mm -hmm. down um, a couple of points from where it was last year, but what you can see in this graph is that over the over the last four years as, as a percentage of A's you're over 30 percent in terms of where we where um, the and this is by the way this is only core courses we take out all of the music art all of that this is just academic courses I will also point out that the the number in the honors courses is higher and the and it's lower in the level two classes to get to that kind of number of 31 percent so the the if you just to continue to battle the the sometimes lingering perception in the community that A's are rare, they're really hard to get. Um, this this the data just doesn't support that notion anymore, um, and it hasn't for quite some time. What, what year did we go to the eight the eight period? Eight period day would be two years ago. Um, so, ten eleven. You connecting that to this, I don't. Okay. I mean, is, it, is there, I mean. I, I, I don't think there would be a. More A's. I don't think of a correlation. Direct like correlation. Oh, with the extra study hall time for freshmen? No, that would be an interesting thing to look at. To yeah. Get A's in, I guess. Well, yeah. That's what we can take out of every the elective. Right. Right. This the is core, are core are courses. Only, yeah, this is core courses. Not including. Right. So. Just a, a couple of other points that we always report out. Um, steady on. Um, College attendance, 90%. Uh, we sometimes have been 91 or 92, but this year was 90. And 83% uh, of those to a four-year school, which again is historically a steady uh, number. Um, we are definitely seeing more gap years. I don't know if that's something you've talked about with folks in the community, more people kind of taking a year off before heading to college. So that 90% actually, we, we don't count them as heading to college, even though I think we should, probably should, because the, most of them are taking a year off. We, we're, mm -hmm. we're, what we report on this one, and to keep it accurate historically, is where they're immediately headed. But we are definitely seeing an increase in the gap year. Um, of course, for years now, we've talked about all students having a defined plan, and our number for the competitive, we track that competitive college admissions, and it's remained, um, some years it's 18, some years it's 17%, this year it was 17%, no cause for alarm. We are getting kids into the best schools um, in, in the nation, so that's uh, certainly one of our expectations. That's the data piece, happy to pause if there's any questions about any of those slides neil do you know where the um the kids who are taking the gap year do you know what they're doing do they do they report yeah. to you guys what their plans are yeah there's some interesting travel opportunities kind of formal um so they'll combine little study opportunities and you're 
off to um, a Spanish-speaking country, for instance, to do kind imagine. of a combination mm -hmm. of community service and study and, and using the language. There's also um, one student who worked um, as kind of a teaching assistant in, a, in an inner city situation. And it's the idea that before you head off to college, it's kind of a service in, and getting out of your comfort zone. So there's, the, I mean, there's kind of a little industry developing around it. And I think that families are discovering some pretty cool opportunities. And um, our, our, I know that our uh, school counseling department has spent some time um, investigating more and more what the gap opportunities are because they're being asked about them. Um, and the feeling that maybe it's appropriate to, after the, the grind of academics to kind of take a step back before you head to college and have a different experience. Uh, what I've done here in this very, very brief portion of, uh, as it, it's not all about the data, it's trying to tell the story of our work and uh, have come upon a, a format here where what I do uh, on this is I take the opening PowerPoint that I offer to my faculty, I kind of edit it down for open house purposes to talk to the parents and then use essentially those same slides so that the message is consistent from what I'm, what I'm delivering to my faculty, um, to the parent community open house and then to you about our work. So certainly. I, I, as I always do, I, we reference our mission, um, and I think that notion of uh, what, why we went to the eight-period day and why we are so um, uh, cognizant of offering kids extracurricular opportunities and sports and athletics and uh, arts and service opportunities is about that personal fulfillment, letting kids find their, their niche in Simsbury High School. Um, but also, I think, uh, despite the hiccup that happened on Friday, talking about civic responsibility, and that's been a consistent message for us um, uh, at Simsbury High School. So uh, I always do this. This is the part we just went over um, that this is something I highlight for our faculty and for our parents. So I do give them some of the same. You get it in a little more detail than the parents do, but we always highlight those achievement results. Uh, moving on to the themes for this year, we, we are under three umbrellas, really talking about school culture. Um, we've done some great work around our Trojan Code initiative, um, have uh, some other points of emphasis on that. Implementing teacher evaluation. I know this board has heard from the Central Office Administration about what our district has done with teacher evaluation. Implementing at the building level has been a real challenge, and but I think one we're succeeding with. And then, of course, our work around Common Core is the three main themes of what we're working on. So one slide on each of these to talk about school culture. Uh, two years of intensive work with the Trojan Code and um, talking to students about uh, uh, expectations in uh, different areas. Areas. Clearly, we need to uh, talk about expectations for Spirit Week as one that we maybe didn't cover well enough, uh, but we'll take care of that. But I, what I want to say is uh, we should have another presentation just on this from um, Eileen Eustace and Eileen O'Neill about the discipline data and where you can see the um, the drop in discipline data from one year to the next. I mean, it's a, it's a noticeable um, improvement that we've had. We're... Uh, proud of that and you know hope to keep that momentum going we did uh, a little um, reconfiguring with our SHS connect it remains a uh, uh, ninth tenth and eleventh grade experience but we have hundred and forty members of the senior class who are acting as facilitators for the SHS connect groups and that numbers with their they're volunteering instead of being on kind of the free uh, period that uh, 17 minutes that seniors have at that point they go into the rooms for the younger classmen and run the activities 140 kids who stepped to the plate um, to do that and putting a little more structure to those activities. As part of teacher evaluation, every teacher actually had to make a small goal around a commitment to what they're going to do personally to improve school culture. And so that was a that was a very interesting part of our conference is to say some little effort that they're going to make. And, and obviously, uh, we talked to people about a greater good, looking beyond just your class or your activity and looking at the, the broader perspective of Simsbury High School. Uh, my emphasis with the new teacher evaluation plan is that we did do a homegrown plan. It would have been very easy to accept the state model as is and start 
uh, churning, but th through the work of Aaron and Sue and a whole bunch of people on the PGE committee. I mean, I think the fact that we used our own standards, that we made teachers comfortable with the same language they had been using um, over time was paid huge dividends when we went to implement this. Um, in, in terms of implementing it in a large school, the largest, 140 uh, uh, teachers that um, had to have an beginning of the year evaluation conference. We just finished them uh, about a week ago, and all 140 of those conferences were scheduled between um, my three assistant principals and myself in a three week period. And we um, really committed to doing it the right way um, and are proud of that. And they were really fabulous conversations that we had with teachers. It's a huge commitment to get to that point. Um, in terms of classroom observations, our, we're very proud of the work we've done a couple of years ago and that we continue around the concept of student engagement. And we actually have descriptors that we talk about with teachers um, and check ourselves against student engagement, so uh, uh, against those descriptors. So when we go into classrooms, are we talking about the same language around uh, students actively participating in the learning um, and great professional development with our leaders and our teachers um, around that that whole concept and, and something we value and certainly while I've talked yes there are teacher ratings and there are for teachers that's not comfortable for people in the business world I know they've been getting ratings for years um, for uh, teachers that's not comfortable and yes there are going to be ratings and that's going to be a tough part of this at the end of the year but uh, we are trying to emphasize the conversation that are unfolding with uh, with teachers and administrators and then lastly I can probably go very quickly here because Aaron had the Common Core presentation um, we're tr we we have uh, certainly talked about them being appropriate uh, standards for Simsbury because uh, we think we've maintained a lot of our traditional excellence some some people refer to it as kind of old school stuff and we're okay with that mm -hmm. um, but with new expectations um, for rigor around the types of I, I guess I would describe it as the the text difficulty that kids are going to face and having very complex short pieces of text that they're going to have to uh, um, battle with and our teachers are doing that work um, talking about the Common Core being a collective responsibility if people think this is about English and math teachers we're really gonna blow it it's about everybody contributing to the work and that's part of what our theme has been at Simsbury High School and uh, professional development on November 5th is solely focused on Common Core work and we're gonna have a great day um, one of the things that the teachers are going to do Aaron referenced the practice test that uh, people could take every teacher at the high school is going to have some time to actually see what the kids will face and take the practice test now we're going to talk about what um, happens uh, when they see that they experience the test themselves so a few other new things uh, as you will know from my messages we talked uh, uh, we did a lot of hiring over the summer um, some expected some unexpected but brought in a great infusion of new leaders from uh, the assistant principal level department supervisor level um, certainly new new folks in uh, important departments guidance and special ed and um, uh, a wonderful uh, group of new teachers um, I want to talk a little bit about Plato learning which is uh, we we made a philosophical change in our online provider for years you've probably heard me talk about the virtual high school which was a partnership that we had we went in a new direction because we thought Plato learning a different online provider offered us a lot more flexibility virtual high school was pretty much a real-time experience you got assignments from one Wednesday to the next Wednesday and had to do them within that time period Plato does not have that similar format and not only only can you use Plato learning um, for starting a course from scratch and um, doing an online uh, experience but we can also use it for remediation so that students who are in summer school and we had a number who did it this way if let's say you get to the end of the year and you have not passed algebra one well surely you have some knowledge of algebra one because you've been in the course all year you can actually use the Plato system to test them find out what they know we don't have to reteach that, remediate what is uh, the units that they aren't experiencing mastery on, uh, ha run them through the online experiences there, and then retest to. So it actually allows you to pinpoint as a much more flexible system. We had some great early success with it in summer school, and we're using it now to um, 
uh, right now uh, use it with some students who have fallen behind in credits and uh, it's it's an opportunity to make sure that they they uh, stay with their peers where they uh, in terms of graduation progress and then uh, Sue's reference and communications about some new security procedures that are upcoming our training um, happens next month and there will be a little bit of a different look to um, some of the things that happen with our code red or lockout drills um, if you will so uh, end this with the the uh, statements that our achievement results continue to keep us at the top of the state that's where we expect it to be um, uh, I, important for you to understand as a board that we are I talk to my high school principals and other places we are so far ahead of where other people are with Common Core um, you, you need to know that um, others are just starting to take a look at it um, and are gonna uh, have a, a much sharper learning curve uh, very proud of our Trojan code work and overall the theme for me is that we think we've approached this tough educational reform work as a high-performing district should and kind of let um, it be a, about uh, kind of clear away the clutter so that ultimately uh, what uh, we try to keep it about is that very simple in our district we talk about the instructional core all the time because when it comes right down to it there's only three things that are in a classroom there's teachers there's students and their content and there's content and you got to clear away the clutter and just make it about teachers students and content um, and that's what we've tried to do in the way we've handled the reform matters um, so is I think that's, that's any questions or comments about yeah, this Neil, portion um, going back to teacher evaluation I, I think I heard you say that you and your and and your staff over the last few weeks had some of the conf had the conferences with the teachers so I guess a question I would ask because it's a huge investment of time yep. and I'm thinking one of the I guess signals that there's value to this process if there's kind of insights that are being shared back and forth that maybe aren't shared in other venues just just can you talk a little bit about what you experience with this this round and are the signals positive do you what do you what's yeah. your assessment at this point I, I certainly think that um, in in the past we've had a lot of our conferences with teachers in very quick fashion um, you know it's you you, you do a goal setting um, situation or um, uh, observation and it's a 10 minute conversation after these were with a full agenda and a schedule um, that really ran each teacher was given a full period to have the conversation right. so to me the depth of the conversation was a different experience than we've had at the high school level and the fact that we have not always included building administrator and department supervisor in that conference with teachers and I think the triangulation was useful and right. that it allowed us sometimes just department supervisors have had the conversation and administrators have come in but to, to make that commitment that we're gonna do this as a team I thought paid dividends I also thought the professional development we work did work that we did they set really good goals they set goals that made sense a lot of it um, uh, Mr. Curtis referenced our end of course assessment work that we've been doing mm -hmm. over the last few years to make our end of course assessments have these complex tasks and they were setting goals around I can improve my students performance from last year to this on how they're doing on those tasks right. and so I think they were meaningful for teachers um, that may get harder when um, it's about right now we're in kind of the vacuum of smarter balanced assessments not being here yet mm -hmm. um, and we'll have to see what goals start to look like once they have to be directed more towards the smarter balance numbers right. was there one area as you had a longer discussion with the individuals was there one area you were consistently able to get into that you just never got to talk about before that you think is particularly meaningful um, one of the things that we did because we used our own Simsbury standards and we just wanted to have a con common conversation with everybody uh, the structure of the document is that each teacher has to focus on two standards of the seven teaching standards we asked every teacher to focus on instruction as the okay. most important standard so the beginning of each conference on our agenda was their personal goals there's a number of indicators under instruction 
What are the specific aspects of instruction that are your focus for this year? They described the goals that they had, and the process is going to allow us to revisit those very things that they've said they want to try mm -hmm. in January and then again in May. So for me, I think that part, it kind of opened the conference, and, and there was a lot of energy around. People were excited yeah. about the goals they set. So I, I would point to that one in, uh, in response to your mm -hmm. question. I think the interesting thing will be as the year picks up, other responsibilities unfold. Can we sustain that same concentration on those conferences mid-year and end of year? Because it's a cycle that has to occur three times. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Other questions? The last portion of this, uh, we've invited Mr. Street to make an appearance in front of the board. Uh, pleased to do that after his f uh, first year in Simsbury. Um, and wanted to just give you a very quick update, a couple of slides about where we are with Simsbury High um, Athletics. Um, Dane took over a huge program. He's going to talk about that in a moment, just to let you get a reminder about the scope of it um, and uh, put some new things in place that Want to, wanted to be able to take a, a few minutes tonight tonight and describe that good work. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Street at this point. So good to see everyone again. I know I was able to pop in a few weeks back and, and just say a quick hello. Happy to do the same here tonight. Um, sorry I was late. Uh, senior night for field hockey tonight. They won. So. Oh, good. Yay. <laughs> Having a, a good week so far. A few more senior <laughs> events coming up. So just wanted to touch briefly, um, the athletic department specifically is still one of the largest in the states. Uh, in the state. It's got 33 varsity sports. We have 81 teams when you take a look at all the different levels, varsity, JV, thirds, novices. Um, and for this fall in particular, we have 549 fall athletes. And when I started to look at these numbers, I thought it was worth mentioning that you could see a decrease as the years go on. So 173 freshmen are participating right now, 158 sophomores, 124 juniors, 94 seniors. Those are the numbers for this current season. And I think that really speaks to the fact that we are providing a lot of opportunities for our freshmen in particular to get involved at the high school, make that connection, and, and you know really start to enjoy their experiences at the high school. Obviously, as we go through, we have a number of competitive programs. So the numbers are going to decrease specifically when you get to the varsity level and junior and seniors are, are typically competing for those same spots so the numbers do decrease but I think it does um, it's a testament to, to to what we've done historically to provide those thirds teams and and sub varsity opportunities for our kids to be uh, participants some of the um, endeavors regarding communications last year we um, had a plan in place to have seasonal uh, meetings at the beginning of each sports season where student athletes and their parents could come um, last year we actually only pulled one of them off due to some scheduling conflicts this we, year we did spring too we did two we did two yeah mm -hmm. we did two last year we missed the winter one due to i believe it probably was due weather. To some of the weather stuff in the, in the winter we did do two you're right uh so the plan is is to continue with those we've gotten some very good feedback um from both student athletes and parents uh particularly again the the younger students the freshmen who are are new to the whole experience and and have a lot of questions about what paperwork needs to be done and who's my coach and where's practice and all of those types of things. So um, at each one of those meetings, we spend about 45 minutes addressing the, the stuff that is the same for all of our sports, introduce them to the training staff, um, things of that nature. And then we have breakout sessions um, for each of the individual teams so that the coaches can present stuff that's particular to their team and their program um, and answer questions that, that students and parents might have prior to the season even beginning. Um, they also uh, do a good job of laying out if there's a cut process in place uh, for those programs that do have to make cuts, what that looks like uh, uh, and what they can expect as they go through that. So those have been very successful. Um, a second endeavor regarding communications is um, the SHS website. We revamped the athletics piece of that. And if you've looked at it recently, you'll notice um, different sidebars uh, for athletics that include a lot of different uh, pieces of information um, in there from things like uh, directions to away games and and most importantly the newest edition were the team pages so we we've created team pages for each one of our our uh, programs where there's information on the coaches how to contact them there's links to the schedules there's a, a lot of good stuff that that is available for um, parents and for for uh, students to access and the newest development in, in regard to that is this fall we we are piloting an intern program uh, where we brought in a hand 
handful of, of students who expressed an interest and actually put them through an interview process uh, and selected three interns who are helping with that website work. So uh, our three interns are working with uh, our coaches, our team managers, and the students on those teams, and, and with me, of course, to keep those, those web pages up to date. Um, and that's been very helpful. You know, there's a lot of information that needs to get out there, and, and certainly before we brought them on board, it fell to, to me or to my secretary mainly to do that work. And so now we have a little bit of help in, in keeping those pages up to date. And lastly, I'm sure that you spoke a little bit about social media, social media earlier and, and how it can be used negatively, but I think um, I've received a lot of positive feedback in, from my Twitter account. I use it uh, primarily for uh, informational purposes, uh, uh, notifying anybody who wants to know who's following me about uh, games that are coming up or, or the day's activities, and certainly when there are changes to them, um, getting the information out that way. Um, we've also started, a lot of coaches have, have opened up Twitter accounts and use it to, to inform their teams about different things that are going on. So that's been a positive as well. The financial side of thing, obviously we're getting ready to enter into our budget season. Um, so we have made some progress in this area. Um, basically my first year was to live through it and try to wrap my head around the way it all worked. Uh, but the general analysis after, after having one year under my belt is that there are basically two sides to this. There's the Board of Ed funding, um, which in, in working with Mr. Sullivan and Mr. LeClaire, we've, we've uh, cleaned up to a certain point so that it, it basically falls where the Board of Ed funding is covering all of our coaching salaries. So that's a, a quite a number of coaches and, and um, a, a huge dollar amount as we go throughout the year. The other half essentially it actually breaks down to last year was about 55 percent of, of the department expenses are coaching salaries and the other 45 percent are operational costs and that comes primarily from pay to participate um, we're still operating under the same system that's been in place for a couple of years now it's 175 dollars per student per season we do have the 200 dollar additional assessment for ice hockey and swimming um, and those are basically that covers the athletic department uh, between the board of ed funds and then the the pay to participate covers uh, the operational costs. In looking long term, um, we have opened the discussions a little bit about possible changes to pay to participate and or the assessments. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at um, some data regarding rental fees, primarily for um, Westminster Pool for the winter time for the swimming and diving team, and then the ice hockey ranks for, for um, the winter season as well and that's a significant expense and so when we look at it we, you know we've started to talk about does it make sense for us to adjust uh, the assessments in those sports to help offset some of uh, a little bit more percentage of those costs so those are some of the things that we're looking at um, and then of course uh, also in the in the long-term planning is the fact that our diminishing class sizes will play mm -hmm. a role in this um, I think it's important to note that I it won't have an immediate impact on athletics. Uh, we are still at a point where, um, you know, a lot of our teams do have to make cuts. And so if we have 80 kids try out for volleyball and we keep 36, or we have 60 kids try out for volleyball and we keep 36, from a financial standpoint, at the end of the day, we still have the same number. On the other hand, you'll have programs like Girls Outdoor Track that last year had over 100 participants. They don't make cuts. As we see diminishing class sizes, I think it's fair to, uh, to, to project that you'll see a diminish in those numbers, which would affect our, our bottom line on the financial side of things. So those are just, those are on the radar and things that we hope to keep an eye on as we go How forward. long have we been at the 175? Ooh, uh, maybe about four or five years. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's important to note as well because costs do go up. Um, every year, you know, the, some of the main costs that we have aside from coaching salaries are transportation costs and officials fees are, are the two of the big ones. And so as transportation costs go up and officials fees invariably go up a small percentage each year, we've kept our pay to participate flat. And so we need to, you know, just be cognizant of that looking forward. Some of the other current initiatives in the athletic department is um, we are taking a very close look at our booster clubs. That started last year, a uh, very uh, cursory look last year when we just had some very quick conversations with coaches about the way that they operate. This year, uh, Mr. Sullivan and I have been working um, season by season uh, with that mindset in place where as we headed into the beginning of the fall season, we, we met with every fall 
uh, varsity coach and if they have a booster club or the representative from their booster club um, so we worked through all the fall sports um, we learned a lot about the way some of the groups operate that we either weren't aware of or or you know just there wasn't a whole lot of good communication in that area and so we we learned a lot as we went through the fall season the intent is to do the same for for the winter sports um, hopefully as soon as uh, we're able to here before those seasons kick off and then again in the spring to just make sure that we know what's going on um, with some of the parent groups that get themselves organized and act as boosters to make sure that, um, that, that it's in agreement with what our mindset is regarding what their role should be. This is just very, the board will be familiar that some groups have come over time. I remember the wrestling folks last year came and made a presentation to you. So some have operated in a very formal, we're going to raise the money, we're going to make a board donation, and some have not operated that formally. And this is trying to get um, folks in a more systematic way, because there's a decent amount of money out there that is in the name of Simsbury High School Athletics. And so uh, another piece to that is, do we want to make a change to what's happening in the long term? Again, you know, we've looked at some of the other models in the state of uh, schools that have a school-wide booster club, and and within that school-wide booster club have all these independent, you know, related to football or whatever the case is, uh, but they're all kind of tied together under one umbrella and working a little bit more uh, efficiently, I would say. And so we've looked at some of those models and we're trying to determine if that's something that we may want to do going forward. I would say by the end by the end of this school year once we've had a chance to talk to all of the different groups and we have an understanding of where they all are, uh, then we'll be able to come back and, and decide whether or not that's some, uh, the direction we want to go. Uh, second initiative that we got off the ground last year was the Trojan Leadership Academy. Um, there used to exist a captain's council uh, in which the captains of each of the sport would get together periodically, talk about things that were going on on their different teams, issues that they were dealing with. Um, and in speaking with Tyler Webb, who, who unfortunately left the district, but was heavily involved in that initiative, um, when I came on board last year, we had a conversation and he said he thought it, it served a good purpose, but that often it was too late. That we are talking with seniors who kind of already have their minds made up about certain things and sometimes it wasn't always effective to be able to, to make change and, and help them become the best leaders they could be. So we worked last year to create the Tro Trojan Leadership Academy. It was a six session um, workshop basically where students volunteered to be a part of it. Um, there were six after school sessions, they each ran for an hour. Uh, we targeted mainly sophomores and juniors last year. Um, and, and we spent time talking about, you know, what it means to be a leader um, of a sports team. And that was the main focus. What does it mean to be a captain? What are some of the things that are expected of you? Um, you know, the roles and responsibilities and, and are you up for that? You know, I think a lot of people want to be leaders or at least they think they do until they realize, well, that it means maybe I don't get to be friends so much anymore as a liaison to my coach and and so it, it, we had some very good conversations about what leadership is and what it looks like in the athletic setting um, we were able to have some speakers come in and talk about their experiences um, and then we closed out the session with a very good um, workshop where where they had to work together uh, to accomplish tasks so it, it was very productive for a first run through uh, the intent is to repeat that again this year um, again i think we'll continue to target the younger grades just sophomores and juniors who will probably be rising up into those roles of captains of teams and things like that their senior year so it was a good start um, but i would say that there's uh, still some work to be done to continue to improve that initiative the intern program i spoke about briefly earlier we are piloting it right now it's going fairly well and so as we wrap up the fall season we'll uh, determine if there are changes to be made to that going forward and then the role of team managers is another one that um, is is we're beginning work in that area um, team managers we find that they take on very different uh, job responsibilities depending on which team they're with and some of them are very structured and very organized and they're expected to be at practice and they have spe specific tasks every day to get their, their their team ready to go and other ones they just kind of come to the games and provide goodies for the team and so <laughs> we're looking at, at trying to come up with some consistency amongst our team managers and these are some of the things that can be expected of our team managers um, because invariably it's another experience that a lot of people will point to and and we'll include on a, on a resume or a college application, and so it should have some meaning to it. And so that's what we're working on in that area. 
Looking ahead, uh, the Athletics Advisory Committee um, kind of took a hiatus last year. As I came in, they said this, this group existed. You maybe want to give it a little time and then see what you want to do with it. But that is certainly something that I do want to get going again. Um, and, and combined with that athletics advisory, I think one of the uh, initial tasks that we'll look at will be a facility analysis. Um, Mr. LeClaire and I have talked about some of the facilities uh, concerns that we have at the high school, not just from a, a safety standpoint, um, but also for, you know, from on the other side of that coin is providing what we should be providing for um, the, the large pro athletic department that we have. You know, it's one of the best and biggest in the state. And, and are we equipped to continue to provide the, the best to our student athletes and to all of our athletic programs? So we, I think it's important that we start looking at um, the possibility of a, a renovation plan uh, to make sure that we stay current before things uh, get too far away and would not be cost effective. And then lastly, an assistant coach implementation plan. Um, it was part of the CIC self-study a number of years ago to begin to implement assistant coaches in certain sports, and we have begun to do that this year, and we've got a five-year plan in place to uh, continue to get those into, into place um, so that we, again, are, are, are providing the type of support for our coaches that we should. So those are some of the things that we have on our radar going forward. Good. Happy to answer any questions that you have regarding any athletics. Questions? Well, that's been quite a year for you. It's been a busy quite, one. Quite, yeah. quite a year, and uh, and um, impressed with the new initiatives that, that are coming forward. So it seems you'll have another um, very busy year ahead of you also. They just wanted to commend you for a successful yeah. first year. Thank you. Um, you know, it's a significant part of, of the comprehensive high school, and I think you've made great strides in particular with some of the things you've done with communication, which I think are forward thinking and, and really setting us in the right direction. So thank you. Thanks. If I could add one last note, especially in regards to communication, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, but um, we do have a program set. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. For, it's for uh, appropriate use of social media, and so we had a we had, I had spoken to a gentleman last year about that program targeted more specifically at student athletes, and um, then after some of the events recently, uh, we had him back in and said, you know, maybe this is something we want to put in place for all of our students, and so he said, sure, we can we can adjust that uh, that presentation slightly, and so that's something that we have scheduled for November 19th. Um, we have his name is Tom Pinsens, he's the assistant athletic director at. Central Connecticut State University. It's going to come in and spend an evening talking about um, Facebook and Twitter and how to use them for good and how to be safe and be careful and, and just be aware of, of the dangers of them. So that's a program that uh, we're excited about and I think is, is very relevant given some of our recent events. Mm -hmm. Great. That's good. Dane, I just had a question. The Trojan Leadership Academy, which I think is great, and I love the idea that you kind of get to the kids on the younger side so they actually have a handle on it. It's not just, hey, I'm a captain kind of a right. thing. Um, have you thought about or is there something in place to kind of promote the leadership within the club structure that you have because there's so many clubs and again being an officer of a club is not just hey I'm the president kind of a thing absolutely and in fact I spoke with Kaylee Donovan already who's the the uh, student council advisor mm -hmm. and she brought that same idea and, and it's something that we're kicking around right now um, actually we're hoping and we haven't sat down together to really plan it out yet but when we ran the Trojan Leadership Academy for student athletes that was every other week uh, during the during the winter season and so the thought is to see if we can take what we have tweak it a little bit so that it's more targeted at activities and offer it in the other every other week so that it will essentially be every week there's an opportunity for kids to come in and it's either focused on student athletes or it's focused on your school activities um, but yeah it is it is something that we've looked at and we're hoping to put in place for this year great thank you yep another good initiative so in public audience so you'll have a chance to ask that they will still be here thank you great any other questions all right good thank you very much for that very thank informative you. report thank you very much all right. all right we are now on to exhibit eight quarterly budget analysis Okay. Uh, what new initiatives do you have for us this year? <laughs> well, we're not going to find that in this uh, exhibit tonight. Um, we have, we have uh, uh, a couple of 
couple of lambs we're we're highlighting uh, that may be a, a variance, but overall we, we're still projecting a, a uh, positive balance by uh, year end. And to start off with looking at some of our um, revenue um, restricted state and federal grants, we're still looking basically on target, as you may recall from our budget process and our, our, our newer mm -hmm. format. We project about $3.2 million in uh, restricted state and federal grants. We're still looking at uh, a very similar number. Uh, we had concerns last year about the uh, federal budget process. We did not see any cuts uh, to the uh, IDEA grants through that sequestration process that we heard about. However, as our, as our latest grant um, Came, came through this year, uh, there was a reduction in the IDA grant, which is one of our two largest grants, the other being um, our choice grant based on the number of students that we have uh, coming to our to our district. That's basically uh, looking right on, right on target. We do anticipate that some of the IDEA revenue um, can be um, made up through uh, what we hope to be larger uh, Title I grant and uh, chef grant um, funding we don't the the timing uh, in the first quarter every year is such that we don't uh, receive all of the the federal grant and the state grant uh, notices mm -hmm. so we're not on the, you know we're not clear yet what the final picture will be and then there are also the uh, statewide caps on some of the transportation and health and um, adult ed uh, and finally excess cost grants so we're always kind of waiting for that as the uh, year goes on but overall we're looking relatively on on uh, target uh, to uh, tuition revenue is right on target that we um, estimated from out-of-district students now in terms of uh, a couple of the areas that were highlighted in our in our line items we had the modular classroom uh, removal process so mm -hmm. essentially we've Expended funds out of the current year to take those modulars down, but we expect to to uh, uh, have an offset in the uh, cost of the uh, utilities for those, and so that's part of the projection that you see here. Second page of our update, just to remind everyone that we look at the um, budget in quarters, and the column that says what was our plan uh, assumes that we would expend everything in four even quarters but because of the school year process that first quarter doesn't doesn't line up uh, in that fashion and the largest portion of our uh, major account groups is the instructional group and that is uh, a 38 million dollars almost 39 million dollar budget so you see that we don't uh, we don't spend as much on salaries for that first first quarter so we see that positive variance there but was as we uh, look at the first quarter last year, we're very similar in our overall spending. And um, we're going to keep an eye on several areas. And by our, our next quarter, we'll be able to update you uh, better on that since we really only have one full month of, of school being open. So we have our, our annual updates on staffing and the um, K-12 enrollment status, which you've heard reports about recently. So if there's any other questions, I'm happy to Sue so will be reporting out on enrollment at mm -hmm. the next board meeting, the look yes. ahead for the projections. So we'll have a pretty detailed right. report on um, what that looks like over the next five to ten years. Okay. Any questions? Over? All right, seeing none. Um, after consultation with um, Mr. Curtis and um, who's had conversation with Dane Street over here on our Exhibit 9, we are going to, I would like a vote to amend the capital improvement plan from exhibit nine for the next meeting to put on the agenda do you want a movement uh, yes i would to move to, to, move to the next meeting the capital improvement plan right. yeah. table it tonight yeah so move to amend the agenda to uh, table exhibit nine to the next meeting second oh any discussion all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. We will move it to the next meeting of November 12th. All set, Katie? Great. Thank you. 
All right, we are now on to public audience, our second public audience. Anyone wishing to address the board may do so. Please state your name and address. Sir. Brian Kagan, 70 Adams Road. This is a question for Jane. With the captains, are you putting together the program for the kids? Is there a similar program being put together for the coaches so that they come about kind of what's the best captain? Because as I'm sure you're aware, sometimes the captains pick as the best player who isn't necessarily the best leader, right. vice versa. And is there some type of integration between the two? Well, we haven't put in a, a specific plan or a program for coaches, although I will say I've spent a lot of time talking with coaches over the past year of what does it mean to be a good captain and who are you thinking about and so I think our coaches are pretty well aware that you know not always the best players make the best co uh, captains and those sorts of things um, we don't have anything specifically in place for coaches but it's not a bad idea and are the expectations the same for captains across the teams and I don't know if that's should be or not I'm just asking well, I, I would say in certain areas they, they have similarities, you know, especially when it comes to communication, uh, being a liaison between the team and the coach when needed. Uh, certainly from a day-to-day -day standpoint, you're going to see variances. The captains of the crew team are far more responsible for equipment and things of that nature than, than they might be for, say, a soccer team or something like that. But they do have some similarities. Um, the one thing I will say is that we did keep coaches informed of which kids were participating in the Trojan Leadership Academy so that as they start to you know, look at their team and try to make decisions on which, which kids might be considered captain material, they at least have that that piece mm -hmm. of whether they participated or not. So that was one way that we, we kept them involved. Good. Thank you. Any Anyone else wishing to address the board? All right, seeing none, uh, we are at the end of our meeting. Our next Board of Education will be on Tuesday, November 12th, 2013 here. With that, I would like to entertain a motion to um, adjourn. Adjourn. Conclude. Adjourn. Adjourn. <laughs> conclude. adjourn. I, I was <laughs> lost for words. Um, do I hear a motion? So move. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Good evening. Good night.